In this series, we are looking at one of the names of God, Emmanuel. The various names which are attributed to God are names that define his character and nature. Last week, Ross covered a lot, but one of the things that he covered was a trait that we wouldn't necessarily attribute to God. Jealousy. Exodus 34, 14 for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Jealousy. So in this series, we're looking at one of the names of God, Emmanuel, God with us. We know that God has a lot of names, Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah. In the New Testament, Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd, the Door, the Vine, all these names communicate God's character and nature. They paint a clearer picture for us to understand who God is. But jealousy? We've experienced jealousy ourselves. We've been jealous. But when we think of jealousy in the context of a relationship, we go back to thinking of the jealousy of an insecure high school relationship. You know, when you were talking to another boy, just simply getting homework, and he comes up, were you hitting on my girlfriend? Or you made another girl laugh. Why don't you date her then? This is kind of the, the insecurity that we've been exposed to, and so when we think of jealousy, especially the jealousy of God, is, is that what we are to envision of him? Is that the jealousy that he possesses? God is a jealous God, but it's not the jealousy that we think. One of the shows that I like to watch is uh, Dr. Phil. It's not a show I watch often because I don't have cable, but it's one of those shows that when I start, I can't stop. So let's hope it's not like a marathon. But on one of these shows, he had a, a man whose wife was being led astray by a so-called pastor in, in Africa. I mean, this guy was half her age. I mean, it was very clearly a, a green card kind of situation. But she was in too deep. She was enamored. She was infatuated. But what I loved was Dr. Phil got her husband, Keith, on the phone with this so-called pastor. And this is what Keith said to him. All this stuff you're talking about, you're a Christian. Well, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but the one I read says that it's one man, one woman, and you don't covet your neighbor's wife. And also, I hope you don't think that I will give up willingly. This woman was a gift of God to me, and I will fight until the very end to save her. See, it's interesting. When we, when we hear this, we... We'll probably call this love, faithfulness, and certainly it is, but it is also jealousy. See, jealousy can be good. A man who would fight for his wife so that she would not be led astray by another. This is when love and jealousy meet. This is exactly what we see with the God of Scripture we do see a loving, merciful, but also jealous God who would not just sit idly by while his people are enticed by other gods. Or, as we see in Exodus 34 and 35, when God's people would just actively go and pursue these other gods. Moving forward in the Old Testament, we see a mirror of this in the prophet Hosea. A man who marries a prostitute, he rescues her from her former life. He's given her a fresh start, a new opportunity, but she goes back. And what does Hosea do? Hosea doesn't abandon her. He doesn't leave her. He goes and finds her, and he buys her freedom. Hosea is a type. He's a living representation of God's relationship to his people, the jealousy of God is one important trait of God. I mention it because of last week's sermon, but all of God's traits are essential. We see very clearly the attributes of God on full display in two places 
in Scripture. Now, what I mean by that is we will see traits here and there. We'll see his grace here. We'll see his long-suffering here. For example, in, in Luke 7, there's a funeral procession for a young man. Jesus sees the boy's mother, who's also a widow, and this young man was her only son. In verse 13, it says, When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her. Jesus then goes and raises the boy from the dead. In this text, we see the Lord's compassion. But we don't see his justice or his jealousy here. We see a trait here and a trait there. But to see all of who God is, all that he is on full display, I argue we see in two places. The second is at the crucifixion. But the first is found in the incarnation of God. His character and nature are the reason why he became flesh. God became flesh because of who he is, because he is love, he is mercy, he is long-suffering, and all the rest. Because of who he is, all that he is, he steps into creation. So allow me to get on a soapbox for a moment. We cannot perceive or even present God apart from who he is, all that he is. Now that seems simple. So don't preach about who God is apart from who he is. Simple enough, right? But not in America. See, we live in a culture that will take God's love, for example, and they will make this the all-encompassing trait which makes all that God is. Now, it is true, God is love according to Scripture, but he is not only love. We will single out a trait. We will pluck it from his nature, and we will only view, preach, and teach God from this singular trait. And when we do that, do you realize what we've done? We've fashioned an idol. We've seen it. God is love and only love, which means that he doesn't care about holy conduct. He doesn't care about justice. But that's not the God of Scripture. We, we pluck love out and abandon the rest of who God is because we want this trait to be the only trait and make this trait God and God alone. But even worse, this love that is the all-encompassing entity that is God now is not actually love. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. But God is love in his jealousy. He is love in his justice. He is mercy in his wrath. He is grace in his compassion. You see, this is going to be important for us as we go through the nativity story. As we look at the incarnation of God. Which, by the way, Ross, is the word of the day. Incarnation. I'll try and work it into a few sentences. Who he is, is essential to the incarnation. And so let's look at the story. In this story, we have three main figures of the nativity story, and I want us to focus on those today. The first is Mary. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, the, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken of the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel." which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now I want us to go to Luke chapter one for more detail. Luke 1, 26 through 38. 
Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what this salutation was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she was called, and she was who she was called barren, and now is in her sixth month. Nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What we see here is a young woman who is a part of God's divine will. A teenager called by God to carry, birth, and raise God incarnate. We know that God had this all under control. He knew how this was going to play out. But Mary didn't know what would happen to her as the angel delivered the news. Mary accepted this remarkable call with this statement, I am the Lord's servant, which also translates bondservant or slave. So for a moment, I want us to take a look at what Mary might have been seeing from her perspective at this time. To accept this call might mean some very difficult times ahead. She was not married. And she was pregnant. Now up to this point, and then after. So up to this point, then we have Jesus. And then every child after was only born one way. There were not virgin births running rampant. Okay? So for society, statistically, the chances of this happening, they wouldn't have believed it. They would have believed Mary to have been a sinner, having cheated on Joseph and unclean. Joseph would put her away, and even her own family would reject her. From Mary's point of view, there was a very real chance that she was going to be walking into homelessness, cultural shame, and single motherhood by accepting this call. But for Mary... Her call far outweighed what the world might say or do. I am the Lord's slave, she said. The second person I want us to look at is Joseph. We read in Matthew that Joseph was going to to call off the marriage, but he was going to do it quietly because he didn't want to bring shame to Mary. He didn't want to draw attention to her. Now, as far as Joseph knew, this woman betrayed him. And yet, Joseph's love for Mary went beyond the hurt that he may have felt. He didn't want her to be shamed. I think Joseph can be a good example to some men here. He was not about to drag Mary through the mud. Joseph possessed a remarkable love for Mary. We're beginning to see why God chose Mary and Joseph. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and revealed what the Lord's plan was. That the child in Mary's womb was God incarnate, that the child is Emmanuel, God with us. The text says that Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded. But as an interesting side note, as you go back and read this story, I want you to notice that Joseph steps into the place of headship. Meaning that God appears to Mary telling her his will. Now one would say Mary plays a huge part in God's plan for salvation. She's carrying the very one who's going to be the savior of mankind. Pretty big responsibility. 
But notice, from that point forward, God only speaks to Joseph. When it comes to the safety of Mary and Jesus, God tells Joseph where to go. No more appearances to Mary, only Joseph. Joseph is the head, and he is to lead, serve, and protect his family. And Joseph steps into that role and does exactly that. But this brings us to the third main figure. Though he's third on our list, he certainly is the first. The entire narrative of Scripture is about him. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Here's where our focus will be for the remainder of our time together. I talked about this before, and I want us to hold fast to it. See, truth can be difficult to reconcile, especially when it appears, strong emphasis on appears, that there are two truths at odds with one another. What do I mean? Why would God be with us? Why is he Emmanuel? See, the answer is both simple and complicated. It's easy to grasp, but it seems to be impossible to hold on to at times. We can hear the truth, and it will be as clear as day, but it seems that when we try and call upon it later, our memory fails us. He is with us because he is Emmanuel. God became flesh because he loves you. Simple, isn't it? It's simple until we fall, as we do. And this simple truth becomes harder and harder to accept. God loves me. God is gracious. God is patient with me. Yes, because he is love. He is grace. He's able to give what is not deserved out of the goodness and charity and love of his being. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Last week we looked at his jealousy. God is the rescuer of his people. He saved them from slavery from bondage. He brought them out of, of Egypt, drove them through the Red Sea. He alone has done this, and then his people want to turn back and worship the false gods that enslaved them. We move forward, and we find Hosea. And as you read the story, you come to find we are just like Gomer. We've been rescued from the life that has left us empty and broken See, Hosea took Gomer as his wife, just as God has taken the church to be his bride. But his bride goes back. We do the same thing. We go back to the very things that enslaved us, the sin that we worshipped before we knew him as Savior. We go back just like Gomer, and we go back because, well, we think that's where we belong. That's one truth. But then we have another truth, and that truth is that you are loved by God, that he is gracious towards you, that he will endure in your shortcomings through his long suffering, that he will lavish upon you grace and more grace. We hear the truth, we hold to it, and yet we keep being led back to what I will call the truth that is easier to accept. It's much easier to accept that we deserve to be overlooked, cast aside, or even forgotten by God. This so-called truth is easier to accept. We are like Gomer, the bride who was rescued, but then went back into the life of prostitution. But Christ is Hosea. Hosea 3, 1 through 3 says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes, so 
I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So will also, so I will also be toward you. Because we know who these people represent, Christ and the church, there are no more beautiful words in all of Scripture when we read this and know that it is Christ who says, So I bought her for myself. Why bring this up? This is clearly pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross that bought us from slavery. But don't you see? The incarnation, the birth of Jesus, God becoming flesh, was the first step in his pursuit to buy you back. There is no cross without the incarnation. His birth is where God puts on full display who he is, and he enters our plane of existence. He wraps himself in our flesh, and he faces our temptation. The end game is the cross, but the first steps towards our salvation is at his birth. And so if you take any notes here today, this is what I want you to write down. I want you to pray over, meditate, and truly wrestle with. This is what I want you to write. Because he is. When we are standing there with the truth that is easier to accept, And then the truth of God's word, which proclaims his nature, his love for you, his grace, his grace that he keeps pouring out upon you generously, his mercy of the gift of another day, the long suffering and patience in his sanctification. When we are at this place and it seems like one truth is at odds with another, we need to understand they're not at odds with one another. Because the truth that is easier to accept is not truth at all. There is one truth, and that truth reigns above all else because he is. Why would God love me? Because he is love. Why would God forgive me again and again And again, because he is grace. Why would God never leave me? Because he is faithful. Why would God be with me? Because he is Emmanuel. Because he is. This is the hope that we have today. Your salvation, your continued fellowship with God, your sanctification, all of it hinges upon who He is. Not upon us, who, if I can be blunt, who are anything but. We are not. All of it hinges upon who He is. Every Sunday, we remember the sacrifice on the cross on our behalf by the one who is. But December 25th, we remember those first steps that were taken as he began his march toward that cross. Those first steps began in a manger. The manifestation of all of who God is The rescue of his bride began when there was no room for him at the inn. Why? Because he is. When we are at that low point, whether it's, whether it's because we've, we've succumbed, we've fallen to sin yet again, or maybe the holiday season is just a difficult time, When we read through scripture and we see all of these names that describe who God is, we need to understand this is not a a plucking out of a single one and then neglecting the rest. No, this is who he is. He cannot be anything else. He cannot be 
not love. As dumb as that sounds. He cannot be not grace. This is why it's so important. We need to truly understand because he is. He cannot be anything other than who he is. And who he is is revealed in scripture. And this God that is revealed in scripture is not a God that is going to kick you to the curb because you failed. He's not a God that's going to abandon you because you're struggling. He's not a God that's going to leave you as you are broken hearted during the season, as you sit there and you feel lonely. He's not abandoning you. He's not left you. He's not forsaken you because Because he is. He is your comforter. He is your savior. He is your mercy. He is your grace. We have got to wrestle with this. And we can't pluck out a single trait and leave the rest abandoned. Because it's everything that he is that makes him so unique. In all of human history. I had it in my sermon and I removed it. It was about a half a page I took out. In all of human history, there's not a single account where mankind could ever fathom that God would become flesh, die for his creation, and rescue them. Not a single account. There are some who say that there are. I can get into that if you want, but there's no account. And you know why? Because that's just ridiculous. Why would God enter into his creation who have neglected him, who have forsaken him, and die for him. Well, that's just ridiculous. As human beings, as we're crafting and and, and making these false gods, it never crossed our mind to create a God that would do that. Why? Because who would ever do that? It's because we're not. We're not, and so we could never fathom. But God is, because he is, he entered creation died for an adulterous people and rescued them from a life that was that that was destroying them and eating them alive it's because he is as human beings we struggled still even as christians to fathom that this god is and that's why we need to truly write this down and pray and wrestle through it because he is we still struggle that when we fall short we still seem to think that he's, he's a God that's not going to be there. That he's not going to be faithful and just to forgive us because our forgiveness is found by what Christ did on the cross, not by your performance as a human being. As we enter this season, this, we see God on full display in that manger. There's only, two, uh, there's only two places that we see God and all he is on full display, and this is the first In that manger, everything who God is became flesh because he began his pursuit to rescue you. And that is a beautiful, beautiful story. Because he is. He is Emmanuel. He is with us. And he's not with you so that he would ever forsake you. Let's pray. Lord, we are completely awestruck and blown away by who you are, what you would do, the salvation that we have. Lord, we struggle with this because so much of our lives are built upon performance. They're built upon people performing and earning our trust, earning our love, earning our affections. And then when we look at our relationship with you, we struggle because though our though we feel this affection and love and commitment to you, our actions don't always follow through and we struggle with that. I think it's because when we look at ourselves and our relationship to you, we would have let ourselves go a long time ago. But God, this is not who you are. And I pray that as we leave here, that as we continue to press into to this nativity story, that we, would, that we would see who you are being manifested in flesh. That we would truly understand and reconcile 
this truth that seems to be easier to accept when it comes up against the truth of your word. Yeah, maybe we would have abandoned ourselves a long time ago, but that's not who you are. Lord, remind us day after day of your incredible long suffering, of your patience, of your mercy, of your grace, of your compassion that you have for us in the midst of our sin and our suffering. Because as Hebrew says, we do not have a high priest that does not empathize. Ultimately, Father, our deepest prayer is that we would come to an understanding and trust in who you are that we would not impose who we are upon you, but that we would let you and your word speak for yourself and that our hearts would completely trust you. During this time, Lord, we ask that you would convict us, open up our hearts, open up our minds that we can wrestle with because you are. That we would truly come to know you in a deeper way. And maybe for the first time, come to know you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.